everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our very own Dr. Douglas Smith, um, who, as many of you know, is one of the co-organizers of this year's colloquium series on capitalism. Dr. Smith is an anthropological archaeologist whose work focuses on the intersection of capitalism and colonialism in the Andes, exploring the political economy of colonialism, labor, and the emergence of markets, and imperial resource extraction. Dr. Smith earned his MA and PhD from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and his work has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the Wenner Grand Foundation, and the Lewis and Clark Fund, among others. He is currently an assistant adjunct professor here in the anthropology department, a consulting scholar at the Penn Museum, and project director of an ongoing historical archaeological project in Peru. Please join me in offering our warmest welcome to Dr. Smith. Could we hit um, one of the lights, please? Um, can everyone hear me back there? Mm -hmm. Mike? Everything's good? Okay. Uh, higher? Or was that thumbs up? Great. Okay. All right. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming out today. Um, thank you, Naomi, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and I just, as the organizer or the co-organizers of this program, um, I also want to just thank everyone for coming out um, on all the various Mondays. Uh, throughout the year. Um, I know the free food is definitely part of it, but I hope you enjoy the talks. Um, after I uh, go today, we'll have a series of four external speakers coming during the month of April. So I look forward to seeing you all there. Spanish dictionary in the early 1600s. Aymara is one of the two major indigenous languages of the Indian Highlands, and he was writing about a century after conquest. When he came to the word, the Spanish word for market, or merchant, mercader, he noted that the Aymara had two words for commercial activity, one fitting within their cosmology or worldview, and one he considered to be Spanish. This dual definition of merchant brings more questions than answers. It does not only solely refer to the ethnicity of the trader, but rather the style or the context. Nor should it be viewed through a temporal lens that pits pre-Hispanic, indigenous, or traditional ways of life against modern Spanish commercial modernity. The Armada heartland of the Altiplano was heavily commercialized by the early 1600s, with the vast majority of trade carried out by indigenous merchants to support the Indian mining economy. Instead, I argue that this dual definition hints at a more intriguing avenue. In the same way that scholars of colonial religion or identity have emphasized the role of fusion, hybridity, or mimicry in the colonial context, I argue that colonial economies offer the same possibilities. In other words, markets of colonial situations offer a window into how economic transformations occur ultimately creating new ways of organizing the social life that are neither imperial nor indigenous. I use this polyvalent colonial translation as an entry point into a broader consideration of capitalism in the colonial context. Like many of the speakers this year, I'm interested in the relationships between states, markets, and societies. To a greater degree than ever before, our daily lives are dominated by global markets, where our labor, our goods, our clothes, what we eat. <coughs> By providing decentralized markets, providing decentralized access to new products, markets can transform societies, destabilize state attempts to control economic life. However, markets also transform economic relations, creating new forms of inequality, and commodify arenas of social life previously thought to be outside the realm of the market. I look at this process of commercialization through the colonial context which often act as laboratories for a suite of practices we often refer to as modernity. Drawing on studies of racial capitalism that have a long history in the black radical tradition, this approach views the dawn of global capitalism 
not just in the factories of Manchester, or the books of Venetian accountants, but also the sugar plantations of the Caribbean, the textile industries of Mumbai, or the mines of the Andes. As Jason Moore notes, for every Manchester, a Mississippi. These early generative spaces of commercial modernity entail what Anna Singh calls friction, or how global processes become charged and enacted in the sticky materiality of practical encounters. In other words, local political, social, and cultural contingencies both produced and disrupted colonial commercialization, leading to questions that unsettle rather than reaffirm teleological histories of global capitalism. Therefore, I ask, what happens when different economic practices and ideologies encounter one another? And how do indigenous peoples negotiate, subvert, or resist the imposition of foreign or colonial economic regimes? Over the next 40 minutes or so, I'll examine these questions using the case study of colonial mining in the Indian Highlands. First, I'll outline my main theoretical intervention, which is a reframing of Carl Polanyi's notion of embeddedness as an analytic for understanding not only how markets change societies, but also how societies change markets. I'll then provide some background to the Mercury Mines of Juan Cabalica, also known as La Mina de la Muerte, or the Mine of Death. And then I'll look at the archaeological evidence across two scales. On the landscape scale, I'll look at the politics of extraction, how power constrained or afforded uh, opportunities for indigenous miners, how it controlled where they could mine or where they couldn't. And then I'll look at the household impact to understand how markets affected everyday lives, domestic activities, food production, etc. Finally, I'll conclude with a brief discussion of capitalism, specifically the ways in which capitalist temporalities have produced the Indian highlands, what the Argentine historian Carlos Sempat Asadoria calls an Eslacio Andino, or an Indian space. One of the pioneers of decolonial theory, the Peruvian theorist Anibal Chicano, has often commented on the role of coloniality in Latin America for its political, economic, and social arrangements. For Quijano, the 16th century began with the violent entanglement of Latin America with the early global economy, not as a consequence of early globalization, but rather it produced globalization. This is akin to the post-colonial formulation of global capital. Take, for example, the classic perspective of Deepesh Chakrabarti, who commented that there are two types of history. History one, global history, and history two, the local histories that produce the globe. This talk is an attempt at history, too, but one that I think requires a different understanding of capitalism. The first truly global commodity, and by that I mean an object produced for the market carried around the globe, was Latin American silver, extracted by the Spanish Empire out of Latin American mines, notably Potosí in what is now Bolivia, sent to Europe, funding Habsburg imperial ambitions, often hiring mercenaries, eventually making its way to China. While Potosi may have supplied the world with silver, the nearby mercury mine of Juan Cabalica supplied Potosi with mercury. Extracted from mercuric sulfide or cinnabar, mercury is essential for efficient silver production. This is because mercury is an amalgamate, sorry, amalgamates with silver, in which you can draw uh, lower grade ores out of, uh, silver out of lower grade ores. By the 1570s, the political economy of Peru had emerged out of these two pillars, mercury from Juan Cabalica and silver from Potosí, creating not only global markets, but also tremendous internal markets within the Peruvian colony. I want to pause here a bit and consider the material aspects of mercury, which is no ordinary metal, famous for centuries for being the subject of various alchemy experiments. I titled this talk, Mercurial Markets, um, because it is a nice alliteration, everyone likes alliteration. But also I think there's something to be said for the material and metaphysical qualities of mercury that offer a way to think through markets and early capital flows. First, as alchemists and early chemists often wrote, mercury presents a strange duality. It is a metal, but it's not hard. It has a shape, but it's also a liquid. It can be the heaviest metal, in liquid form, but once burnt off, it becomes vapor, and it seems light as air. Mercury, therefore, occupies multiple qualities at the same time. Second, mercury seeks gold. Now, of course, this, it does this physically, 
but it also seeks gold in a uh, metaphorical sense. Where Mercury went, so did the Spanish economy. Like the duality of Mercury, histories of capitalism often present seemingly binary states. We've seen colloquium all year different definitions of capitalism, ranging from some speakers who argue any type of trade would be considered capitalism, going all the way back to second millennia BC, to the more classic Marxian definition, which really looks at wage labor. These semantic quagmires become particularly messy when we consider local economic relations in the seemingly global transition to capitalism over the last 500 years. Equating capitalism with all economic activity stretches the definition beyond meaning, something that geographers Gibson Graham refer to as capital centrism. While I don't think we're going to stop using capitalism anytime soon, I do think we should be more specific in how we use it as an analytic. Rather than viewing capitalism as an all-encompassing system or even a mode of production, I think it's best used as a practice. In other words, to refer to something as a capitalist practice, rather than to refer to a capitalist system. This helps us avoid the sticky problem of applying capitalism to temporality. In other words, making arguments about what kinds of people get to be capitalists, and therefore modern, and what kinds of people don't. Gibson Graham further argues that by looking at capitalism as a practices, Rather than an all-encompassing system, we can see all the, the other types of economic activity below wage labor produced for a market in the capitalist form. Of course, if we're looking at a set of practices, how might we study the difference? How might we compare different practices? One notion drawn from the other Karl, Karl Polanyi, is this idea of embeddedness, in which economies are more or less embedded in social institutions. Pliny's embeddedness has been critiqued on a variety of ways, and I'm happy to talk about it more in the question and answer. But one of the more <coughs> recent critiques coming from economic sociology, specifically Mark Grenevetter, argues that all economies are embedded. Well, sure, all economies are embedded in some way. But then again, how can we make comparisons between different types if all we say is they're all embedded? I'm going to argue that actually within this notion of embeddedness, there's two types of embeddedness we're looking at. The way that the economic practices are uh, embedded in coercive institutions, and I'm using the word coercive here rather than political, because corporations, firms can be just as coercive as a state. And how are they embedded in social institutions, community? I'm going to talk about this model using the archaeological data over the next 20, 30 minutes. But I think this offers a much nuanced, more nuanced way to look at capitalism and look at embeddedness in a way that allows us to not only see the differences between different types of economic practice, but still retain the idea that the economy is never on its own. Economic practice is always connected to something. Now, turning to Juan Catalina, it's located around 3,700 meters above sea level in the central Indian highlands, about 100 kilometers east, southeast of the capital city of Lima. It is high, it is cold, it's often subject to very unpredictable weather. It also contains the largest known source of mercury in the Western Hemisphere, which the Spanish discovered in 1563, nearly three decades after they invaded Peru. Of course, when I say discovered, I mean the local native peoples just told them about it, <laughs> as it always happens. In this case, the, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but I work closely with a descendant community of the indigenous miners. And before they had to abandon the settlement uh, due to uh, Shining Path in the 1980s, they used one of the old colonial structures built in probably the 18th century as a school. And they would learn about the discovery of mercury in that school. As one of my interlocutors, Sosimori Larry Lopisca, noted, the Spaniard, and in this case he's referring to the local encomendero, made the son of the Caraca, which is sort of an Indian elite, take care of his hat. The son lost the hat. So fearing for the life of his son, he took the Spaniard to the source of mercury. 
This kicked off 300 years of mercury mining in Huancavelica. To supply labor to the mines, the Spanish appropriated a pre-Hispanic rotational labor draft, known as the Mita, to provide labor not only for Huancavelica, but also Potosí. Different provinces would be required to send one-seventh of their population on annual rotations to the mines of Huancavelica. Once you finished your rotation, you were free to go back home. However, not very many of them did. To give a sense of how it worked, this is uh, coming from a transcript, January, June, 1608, in which these provinces contributed different numbers of people to come work in the mines of Juan Cabalita. Now, one of the things with the Mita system that um, is often important to remember, gets overlooked sometime, I think, is that it was a dynamic system. It changed over the 300 year period. And one way it particularly changed is that people increasingly stopped showing up for the Mita. Why would you go to a place called La Mina de la Muerte? However, the mining still had to be done anyway. And so Spanish mine owners would hire out wage laborers, shifting from forced labor to wage labor over a slow process over a couple hundred years. This allows us to sort of think about it and try to connect it to archaeological time. Now, matching historical and archaeological time is always very difficult. Um, I remember I had um, a lunch with a historian here at Penn recently, and she asked my uh, what period I was studying, and I said, oh, it's about a 300-year period. And her eyes just shocked. Archaeologists work with different time scales. Um, and over the last six years of working in Moncabalica, I've developed a three-part uh, periodization to help us sort of think about the diachronic changes I'm going to talk about. So these are the archaeological periods. SB1, or Santa Barbara 1, 1564 to 1700, roughly, right? And here, the labor system is mostly forced labor, mostly. SB2, 1700 to 1824, you get a mix of forced, wage, and independent labor. And SB3, which is after Peruvian independence uh, from Spain, it's mostly independent later, and I'm going to go much more into this in the talk. So, now I want to talk about the politics of extraction, and I want to talk about how um, Spanish attempts to control mining proceeded across the landscape. Start with a small vignette. In the 1680s, the Spanish mine owners, the Spanish vice royalty, so the uh, administration, and indigenous lords were renegotiating the mining contract. The Spanish viceroy noted that there be no Wadi Chakras Indias, nor Rescataris can be in the small square or a lot or other place on the hill, but only so in the square where they will have the posts and signal sites. Now, I'm choosing to interpret this as not only uh, preventation of uh, preventing women and rescatarians is a word for smugglers. This is a word for um, market women, more or less. I can explain why I know that in the question and answer. Away from the entrance, but also in the square with post and signal sites. This is not an argument about two kinds of market, uh, about market exchange or non-market exchange. This is an argument about what type of market. The Spanish want the indigenous traders to be in the square where they can be monitored. The indigenous traders don't want to do that. I started with this because the role of economic practices and coercive institutions can be looked at in a variety of ways. Uh, in this case, I'm choosing to look at it through space and thinking about how is the spatial production of mining operations structured across the landscape. We can look at it at two ends of the spectrum in terms of extraction, Decentralized, centralized, refining, decentralized, centralized. I did this by doing a survey in 2013, a little bit in 2014, in which it was we walked pedestrian survey transects across the landscape. It took us about three months, around a 85 square kilometer area. Every single evidence of mining we recorded, GPS. I then went through different areas and did a top of them survey, in which I asked. Uh, 
people in the descendant community, what does the name of that help? What does the name of that mine? Then I went through the 18th and 19th century archives and tried to piece together, putting together which areas were mined when, so I could sort of reconstruct the spatial history of the landscape. The earliest period SB1 is dominated by the top of the hill, which is now, of course, no longer a hill. Soon after the discovery in 1564, mining began on the large hill. It's a couple kilometers south of Juan Cabalica and about seven, 800 meters higher. The pit soon developed into a complete mass secret flood. Um, noxious fumes would rise up. So they constructed a large audit, originally meant as an air hole, but soon developed into a pathway into the center of the mine. This provided a degree of spatial control. Remember the earlier analogy of trying to keep the traders out of the entrance. Mining within the mine was mostly vertical in that there were large chambers, some galleries as well, but sort of uh, vertical um, uh, tunnels cut in the rock that allowed for um, not only a concentration of following the quicksilver veins, but also a degree of spatial control. In terms of refining, the earliest method, simply known as Oyas Tapadas, in which people used small ceramic pots to put the cinnabar in, heat it in order to get the mercury. This is somewhat centered around the, um, uh, the sort of main hill, but we see other areas as well. These are sites on our survey. Soon after, though, they developed more industrial ways of um, refining mercury. Uh, these, the two main methods were the jamecas, or the buscaneles, and both of those were in the center. Both of those were in urban Juan Cabalica. Um, it's I often comment to my mom, um, she gets worried about me working in mercury areas, and I note that because most of the refinement occurred in town, it's much more dangerous to have dinner in town than actually work up here on the hill. <laughs> uh, Environmental Health Council, which is sort of an NGO working on the cleanup aspects of the mercury contamination, has located about 15 of the mines and corresponding contamination levels. The second phase starts off much like the first phase. Centralized mining, vertical, in which it's going deeper and deeper underground, but still controlled by one or two access points at the surface. However, this is where the Spanish sometimes are a little too clever for their own good. In order to prevent smuggling, or actually in order to prevent corruption, the Spanish instituted a system in which you could only be governor of Juan Cabalica for two or three years, with no renewal. In one sense, this was to prevent sort of the development of, sort of deep-seated institutional corruption. What this did in practice, though, is that each governor, when he came, tried to mine as much as possible, as quickly as possible, because he knew that he wasn't going to be there for long. We don't know when. At some point in the 18th century, Spanish miners realized there was one area where they knew there was a good source of mercury, but that hadn't been mined yet as the mine started to decline. These were the uh, pillars that supported the internal structure of the mine. It makes sense, right? If you have an upper gallery and you're moving downward, right, you have to leave some pillars so it doesn't collapse. And they knew that those had a good load of mercury. So they started mining those. And they mined and they mined until September 26, 1786, when the mine collapsed. After this point, we see a dramatic shift in the, uh, the exploitation strategy in the mine. There's the rise of a new mining figure, Hayakea, which comes from the Quechua word Payane, to pick up, to reap, or to harvest. Now, this has been going on for, this had been going on for quite a long time, prior to the late 18th century. Women were often not allowed in the mine, um, although, I have bioarchaeological data that says they were definitely mining, but uh, in a legal sense, they were not. However, they were encouraged to take picks and do surface mining nearby, or pick through the tailings. This is something that still happens today. 
Following the collapse, though, the Spanish realized this is the only system that they had left, so they institutionalized it. Whereas before, this was sort of an informal, kind of tolerated illegality. Now it became appropriated, and it dramatically shifted the character of mining operations. Whereas for the first couple hundred years, mining only occurred in this small area. This green line represents mining to the uh, 1800, this blue line to about the 1830s, and then this to about 1900. Mining dramatically increased. To give a sense of what these look like, these large pits in the ground cut into the rock, nothing subsurface, all on the surface. Finally, I'll talk about Santa Barbara III, which was the Republican period. Now, I did not expect when I started working here to find uh, archaeological information, or any information, really, on the 19th century in Juan Cabalica. If you look at the tax registers, almost all output ceased throughout the 19th century. Curiously enough, though, the nearby silver mine of Cerro de Pasco imported quite a bit of mercury during this period. This is usually credited in some degree of overseas sources, Almaden specifically. However, when I started looking through the records of what the miners, what the, what the uh, newly independent Peruvian mine owners were doing, and how they were trying to restart production, this one word kept popping up, Camachos. This is a report from the Deputy of Mines in 1840, and it talks about an attempt to sort of restart mining production after independence. The deputy argues that there was a problem of falta brazos, so there was not enough arms, there was not enough laborers, and that the attempts to restart mining had to be abandoned to the mercy of the Indians, called Machis, who worked them without any rules. Now, in this case, rules means legal title. They're basically squatters. So what do these squatters look like in terms of mining? Well, looking at this site down here, we see it sort of small-scale informal mining. We have some 19th century pottery, uh, local indigenous styles, and a couple of houses, a small community around several holes. In terms of refining, all of a sudden, rather than production being just down here in the urban zone, the refineries, now much smaller, different technology, are spread out across the landscape. So refining had become decentralized. The spatial data then, in looking at coercion, we can see a pattern. The first period, extraction and refining was relatively centralized. Second period, mixed, right? Um, historical sales and archaeological sales don't always get along. Um, it was still centralized until the 1786 collapse, and then it becomes decentralized. However, refining remained centralized. And then, during the third period, a massive expansion uh, horizontally across the landscape rather than the previous vertical transition. So, now I want to talk a little bit about household economies. Um, looking at the way that economic practice are embedded in social institutions, I'm going to look at two different variables. The degree to which assemblages are shared, so to what degree do you share similar material culture and uh, assuming some degree of shared identity with your neighbors. Remember that these mining camps, this one in particular I'm going to talk about, they're drawing people from all over the Andes. So to what degree is there a shared sense of material culture? And then I want to talk about inequality. Um, many societies often have social institutions for regulating inequality. To what degree can we see these? How, to what degree is there inequality between the different households? I conducted this research at the mining community of Santa Barbara. It was settled in the late 16th century. It's about 14,000 feet, 4,250 meters above sea level. And it's clustered, a series of about 200 buildings clustered around a church. After mapping the site in 2015, um, we did an architectural study, and then we did a series of excavations. First, we did test excavations, where we dug one-by-one -one pits throughout the site, 
sort of get a sense of where we can find the deepest uh, intact stratigraphy. So where can we really see sort of changes between the early colonial, late colonial, and republican period? And so we expanded those areas that have the best stratigraphy into larger aerial excavations. Looking at a census from 1779, we can see that it's mostly an indigenous town. Um, I have no textual information about where people come from. Right? Remember, these mining camps are bringing people from all over. I don't know if they're coming from the Northern Andes, um, the Central Andes. There was an archive here, um, but the Shining Path burned it in the 1980s, so it's not there. But we can see it's mostly an indigenous settlement. So, looking at the first time period. Take a look at Unit 22. And if you want to know more about all this, I'm happy to send you a 600-page dissertation on all these units. <laughs> bore you forever, but because this is sort of a general audience, I'm just going to go from unit to unit. So looking at Unit 22, um, we did not find, um, in, ter I'm sorry, in terms of the early period, the evidence for this was actually fairly small. We only had early colonial context, uh, well, technically early and middle colonial context, and a couple units. Unit 22, one of our better defined units, um, mostly because of a really nice stone floor, which was the only case, but it was really good for sort of preservation. In addition to sort of uh, utilitarian undecorated cooking wares, um, we found the two main sort of decorated table wares were these Spanish mayoricas, tin glazed wares, and these painted wares that generally, and this is a tricky binary um, to balance, but probably were more characterized with indigenous use. Unit 13, we find the same thing. Um, to get a sense of sort of the numbers here, um, 59 minimum number of vessels. Um, just for the future, anytime I'm talking and comparing two different uh, units, these are always going to be equalized per meters cubed, right? So I'm not, so it would be strange for me to say, um, oh, this unit has more than this unit if that unit had a much more uh, dirt excavated, right? So I'm always sort of equalizing it so that, or normalizing it so that the comparisons make sense. So if we look at these two units, which were the two who had the two best com um, contacts for the period, period, we find relatively similar patterns, um, both in the total minimum number of vessels per meter cubed, and also looking at the frequency. The painted wares were relatively similar: um, red, white. I'm sorry, red, black, and white. Um, there were very few glazed wares, but those that were there were high quality. And there's really a sense of inequality between the two. Now, shifting to the middle colonial period, I want to check on the status of the uh, the Warmi chakras and there was a huge like the smugglers and the market money. This is a map from 1742 showing the mine. This is what Santa Barbara looks like. Um, this is the town of Juan Capulica. You can see the mine, all the different tunnels. This is so this is before the collapse. Now, if we want to zoom in on the area. And so this is 60 years after they were supposedly prohibited from the mine. Nope, still there. We have a scribe at the entrance. He's sort of recording. Again, this is, to go back earlier in the talk, this is the point when sort of control was very uh, centralized and sort of spatially restricted access to the mine. Then looking at the um, different <coughs> units. So this is unit 13, which we had a good context for the early colonial. Now looking at the later colonial. We can see that, um, looking at the minimum number of vessels, there's a big jump in the diversity of vessels. Right? So rather than just a couple of polychrome, red, red on white, right? all of a sudden we have a new types, red dot, white on red, and these names I know are very creative. Um, we see a jump in the diversity. If we look at comparing um, different vessel classes, though, uh, still relatively um, equal. However, if we look at, so this is sort of the, the assemblage, right? So what percentage 
of the ceramics or in the household. Relative, so they're using the same types of vessels in sort of the proportion in their household. But if we look at minimum numbers of vessels, there's a big jump in inequality. Now, it would be helpful here to know that unit 13 is much closer to the center of the site, much closer to the plaza, whereas this unit is sort of on the edge of the site. Uh, assuming, as we often do in archaeology, that locality is sort of a proxy for power or status, it would make sense that a unit closer to the site, uh, a cl closer to the center of the site, would have greater access to goods. All right, I'm going to speed up a bit, but uh, looking at, finally, the last uh, SB3. Remember, this is the time of these squatters, these sort of um, uh, called humachis, right? The people who didn't have a title to the land but were working in it anyway. Um, when you go through the 19th century literature, these are always portrayed as sort of through kind of 19th century racial elite Peruvian lenses, right? So these are squatters, yes, but they are not aware enough to understand the a good day's work, right? They don't understand what it's like to work for a firm, to work for uh, a corporation. Um, plus, makes in all the expected sort of racial epithets that some of these reports use. So then, I was surprised when I started looking at the 19th century data that, in terms of ceramics, in terms of household material wealth, we see a big jump in not only the diversity, but the quality of ceramics. Not only do we have this vessel class of painted bowls, but we start to get imported British wares. Um, this was, and this, I always found this really interesting, this was a macaw dish found in Unit 13. You can see the talons there, talons there. Now, the actual mechanisms for Sort of British um, transfer print wares, which is what this is, going to Peru is poorly understood. And I'm in no way suggesting that um, they were putting in orders to Staffordshire to get this transfer print ware. However, when you look at the catalog for this vessel from the British perspective, this is a macaw. This is the, uh, it's called macaw pattern. Um, I've given, I've shown this before and people have argued with me if it's a macaw or not. I don't know. It's a parrot of some kind. <laughs> um, however, from the British perspective, this is an exotic bird. Yet for someone in the Central Andes, a macaw would be not a local bird, right? This is the Indian Highlands, but a familiar bird, especially if they had any sort of contact or relations with people on the Eastern Slope. Finally, I just want to look at tablewares real quick. The one thing that jumps out for the 19th century tableware, so now we're looking at not just all ceramics, but specifically serving vessels, is that you don't really see much of a replacement, but rather you see an expansion of the assemblage. In other words, you might expect, for example, um, and I kind of did expect this and I was surprised, that my own goods, which were sort of Spanish fine serving wares, would be replaced by white wares or English wares. We've seen this in other parts of the world. Um, there's a well-known excavation in Venezuela in which, um, which were previously inhabitants used Spanish serving vessels, but then soon after independence, they switched their dinner sets to English vessels. Um, the authors of that study interpreted it as a, a, a desire to sort of participate in kind of Atlantic commercial modernity to uh, engage with sort of British notions of mercantilism or mercantile capitalism. In this case, though, we don't see any sort of replacement. We just see an expansion. I think this is interesting because of the way that this illegal mercury or these informal circuits worked in the Andes at this point. Remember, Juan Capulica during this period exported almost no mercury. However, nearby silver mines recorded quite a bit of mercury being imported. We know from sort of travel's reports that the way these uh, two sources, actually. We know from both travel reports and some of my own ethnographic research that the way these illegal mercury transactions work is people would come up, go up to the hill, have dinner with the local people, and then a mercury transaction would happen. 
Now, the important part here, though, is that during this period, a lot of the traders were multi-ethnic. You had the Ciso traders, you had uh, indigenous traders, you had Criollos or elite traders. There's even one Scottish trader who provided a really great ethnographic account. I think the idea, one way I've interpreted this sort of expansion of assemblage is that one of the ways that the Umachi, so the squatters, were able to maintain the control um, and not avoid, and not end up working underground in these really bad conditions, is that they had a degree of uh, strategy in terms of which sorts of wares to use. You have someone who's going to be impressed by the white wares. Okay, well you put those out for dinner. That's going to lead to a better transaction. Oh, you have sort of a Quechua-speaking trader come up? Okay, put some of the nice painted wares out. I think that ability to, that flexibility to deploy different tablewares in different dining sets helped the commercial interactions in a way that uh, dramatically increased their ability to sort of stay independent. Is that cooperative? No, it's not 305. Okay. All right. So, Reviewing information here. Rather than the uh, coercive aspect, um, the looking at space, looking at the landscape, in which we had a clear trend from sort of centralized and decentralized, in this case we sort of have a U, in which during the initial period, people are rotating through the camps from their local community, from their native communities. They know each other, there's, read of, uh, uh, there's a social institution embedded in their practice. And this makes sense. You can have forced labor yet still have a sense of social or community orientation. That doesn't take away from the horrors of the forced labor. However, as the forced labor system disintegrated, and we shifted more to a wage labor system, inequality rose, and there was a greater degree of heterogeneity in the assemblages between households. Following the independence, it sort of shifted back. While there was heterogeneity within the households in sort of different vessels, individual households had relatively the same access to the same vessels. And correspondingly, inequality decreased. So I want to wrap up with just a few thoughts regarding commercialization and temporality. We started with this model, looking at social institutions, coercive institutions. And we started here, the Mita period, or the forced labor period, in which coercion was very strong, but so was the social institution. Economic practices, whether it be mining, whether it be uh, exchanging goods, whether it be sort of daily activities to reproduce the household, were embedded, both coercively and socially. As the Mita system broke down during the latter half of the 18th century, we get really two options here. And I didn't really talk that much about this um, because it, it gets really detailed very quickly. But social institutions and Indian communities, due to the violence of conquest, due to the violence of this Mita, uh, rotational labor system due to disease. Indian communities had begun to break down. Fewer communities existed to send labor to the mine. People started relying more on either wage labor, which, would be, which we would call one of the weak course of institutions, or debt slavery. Now, the line between debt slavery and wage labor is something that is often beyond kind of the historical record. It's very difficult to see. But we see we have these two sort of bifurcated uh, options. And then finally, in the 19th century, we switch more to sort of community as, I'm not going to say reemerge, a new community has formed. What was once a group of different peoples coming from different provinces turned to wage labor or, I'm sorry, wage labor or debt slavery, the sort of tumult and violence of the colonial process had broken apart Indian communities, but new communities began to form. And I want to end with that, because one of the, I think, both strengths and weaknesses of 
when archaeologists address capitalism is the way that we think about time and the way that we think about what types of people get to be capitalists and what don't. In the case of the people of Santa Barbara, in the case of this Indian case study, they were, in a teleological sense, going through the steps to capitalism that we see in other parts of the world. Forced corvée letter, labor. Increased commodity exchange. Growing wage labor. However, once the Spanish state disintegrated in the early part of the 19th century, and it was replaced with sort of a weaker Peruvian state, Without that coercion, the, uh, the wage labor did not maintain and people shifted to independent forms. And partially, um, this had to do with, I think, the institutional legacy of both the horrors of slavery mining. Why would you want to go underground and work for a poor wage when you can mine mercury on your own above surface? But also the legacy of this Piaqueo system, in which people had, following the collapse in the 1780s, had begun to sort of sift through different areas, do more surface mining. That sort of local knowledge, that sort of landscape knowledge, allowed people to maintain their autonomy in a way that previous generations were not able to. The final point is that in the series of oral histories I've been doing with contemporary members of the Santa Barbara community, I'm often struck by this Again, duality. If you ask someone, what's the history of your community? They say, oh, it's 18th, 18th century, 200 years. OK. If I ask them about sort of Apus or sort of more Indian cosmological notions, they'll say, oh, no, we, we, we've been here forever. We're all descended from a uh, patrilineal ancestor that emerged here, this sacred mountain or Apu. Now, those notions of we've been here forever, but our community formed in the 18th century may seem completely in opposition. But they have no problem holding that duality in their head, and I don't know if we should, uh, and I don't think we should either. Like Mercury, like markets, we can recognize that communities draw from sort of primordial myths and have recent histories of formation. I think this duality of recognizing non-capitalist practices within capitalism or capitalist practices outside of it, or in non-capitalist situations, can be really helpful for sort of going forward and thinking about, rather than arguing, OK, this is the moment a society becomes capitalist, or this is the moment a society doesn't become capitalist, is like Gibson Graham and the iceberg um, uh, drawing I showed earlier, to think about what other aspects, what other practices exist at the exact same time. And I want to thank you all for listening to me. That was really a great, uh, great lecture. Thank you so much. And I'm uh, particularly um, taken with your uh, the, the diagram at the end, where you show the two axes of uh, mm -hmm. coercion, coercion, mm -hmm. and uh, social institutions right there. Uh, and moving from the upper right quadrant by mm -hmm. this uh, left uh, side to the lower right quadrant mm -hmm. uh, in terms of embedding in a new kind of. Uh, Formation. Right. Uh, one of the things I'm really curious about, though, because be, having spent so much time in the lowlands, uh, where people strongly resisted at all being any in any form of coercion uh, to mm -hmm. actually work for uh, the Portuguese in Brazil, uh, and instead a lot of the tribes just dying off instead, and then the importation of, of slave labor from Africa. The Highlands have that. You know, I've always thought of it as a colonial mentality. That is to say, you know, long before the Spanish arrived, there were hierarchical institutions. Mm -hmm. How does the SB1 pattern relate to the prior institutions that are present in that in the Andean region in, in uh, Bolivia? Who does it at all? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, a, um, there's an argument in historic archaeology in the Andes about this idea of the trans-conquest perspective. And that, um, you know, 
take a, take a lower group somewhere in the Andes. They were probably only conquered by the Incas maybe two or three generations before, and then the Spanish come, right? So there's always a temptation looking from sort of, you know, the hindsight of history that, oh, this was a massive event, and it was in hindsight, right? But for if you're just a local person living in the Sordis Valley in the 1530s, this is just another moment of conquest. Right? You've been working for the Inca before, now you're working for the Spanish. In the way that these forced labor systems were instituted, um, for example, I found no evidence of sort of um, chains, of um, um, sort of explicit physical um, ways of coercing labor. Um, it was all done through sort of pre-existing kinship um, order formula formations, right? So rather than, there's a, um, there's a sort of Wano Wamon Poma, which is this Indian writer and artist on 1600, in which he shows a Kuraka, an Indian elite, being whipped for not bringing his people to the mine, right? So in terms of the way it was coerced, um, I don't think, sometimes this system gets paralleled with sort of uh, antebellum slavery in the U.S., and I don't think that's accurate. Um, there isn't, the coercion is done through pre-existing channels rather than sort of new forms of coercion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, sorry, I lost your question there. Um, no, I just you, I wanted to hear a little bit more about the relation between the pre-Columbia and okay, the Okay, so the, the thing that, um, that changes with the colonial system of forced labor versus the pre-Hispanic system of forced labor is that you have the introduction of money and commercialization. So, whereas before, if the Inca wanted you to build this road or build this um, storehouse or something, right, and you didn't do it, well, yes, there was a a coercive physical act of violence that might have followed. Um, but you didn't really have any other option. <clears throat> in this case, you did have the option of rather than sending 20 people to go work in the mines, you could send 10 people and some money. And then the Spanish mine owners would either use it, they did out of pocket that money, or they'd take that money and hire wage laborers. And so while the system had pre Hispanic antecedents, because you have this idea of money and the way you could buy yourself out of it, it sort of very quickly changed, and that's how you sort of get the emergence of the wage labor system. So that would be the main difference. Yes, Bob? There's, a, there's very interesting what you're saying, because uh, even in the total Euro-American context, there's a parallel to what you're saying. Because I'm working on this town, Silver Reef, in the mm -hmm. which is a 19th century American, Euro-American mining town. But there's a native people, not the Paiutes, who were pushed off totally at the margin. They just do washing stuff and gamble, things like that. It's the Mormons who were there first as agriculturalists. They first tried to set up mining districts, and they failed. Then outside, sure, complete capitalism comes in here. Corporations, San Francisco, Philadelphia. The miners are Irish, though, Cornish Irish, generally speaking. And then the mines fail, and these you know, there's a big strike and there's trouble. And then cor correlators, uh, people, I think that's the word, that's the equivalent to your term, when the local Mormons come back in and try to run the mines, and the professional miners criticize them, they all like, they're doing, they're ruining the mines, and, and then they get the mill to run, and then that collapses. So there's a strange parallel mm -hmm. to what you're saying. Uh, and then my other question, that's an observation, my first question is, what happens after 1900 to the present? The area. The road. Uh, so we don't really know what happened with sort of these squatters, the Umachis. We, there's a lot of complaining about them in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. Archaeologically, uh, there's no real break in the record um, in terms of the types of it. And in this case, I'm really making it using British vessels, so there's a little bit of a lag time, as you know. Um, but there's not really a break in the habitation period. And then everything gets sort of abandoned around the 1890s, and they build a new mining camp nearby, mm -hmm. corresponding with the introduction of the railroad. So, um, yeah. you know, I still have to think through this a bit, but there's something about the railroad and sort of a greater investment of fixed capital 
that allows these firms that were previously unable to sort of mobilize labor, maybe they're bringing in new labor, um, to sort of, kind of retake the landscape. However, this sort of squatting, this sort of informal mining activity continues to this day. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still people to do that. Because the railroad's important also in, in my area is floor riders, is the more important place part time Mormons doing it. Uh, but that's a minor deal. So it becomes a ghost town. Mm -hmm. But the Mormons stay, even though they're now running the tourist thing on this uh, area. But then mining disappears mm -hmm. uh, completely in southwestern uh, Utah. So, mm -hmm. One of the other reasons that mercury, the price plummets, um, because they stopped using it for silver amalgamation, um, because they started using cyanide, cyanide which, yes. you know, why? <laughs> One toxic <laughs> material for another. <laughs> Much better for your health than mercury. Yes. <laughs> Yes, Katie. Um, I'm returning to that um, reconquest, post conquest sure. divide. What's the demographic history of this region between the, um, at, at the point of contact? Is there an establishment of more settlements or is there more occupation? This is a, this is a vexing problem. Um, part of the reason is. So in terms of demographics, um, there aren't very many sites in the area. It's fairly depopulated. Um, there are larger sites um, about 15, 20 kilometers away um, that date to earlier periods, mostly Chavin. Um, Richard Berger has worked on one of these sites. Um, and what they're doing is they're taking the cinnabar, the mercuric sulfide, which you get mercury from, and they're crushing it into pigment um, for either painting ceramic vessels or um, Inca use it as uh, cosmetics. Um, in terms of pre-Hispanic mining, so demography there's very little evidence. I mean, we did, we found some scatters and whatnot, but not, no, there's no evidence of any sort of like state administration, right? So if you look at Inca mining in northern Chile, for example, you can see, okay, the Inca state was, was here, was doing stuff. We don't see any of that. Um, the problem though is that this landscape has been completely changed over the last couple hundred years. Um, I think the reason that I asked is because I wanted to know more about food production. Um, yeah. Um, so I didn't. I decided not to present any of the final information here, just because always so much time. Um, there's a shift in terms of, and this is another way I talk about commercialization. There's a shift from alpaca to some cow and sheep, not very much pig, um, which is sort of to be expected. But what's really interesting is that there's a shift from entire animals. So in SB1, and a little bit in SB2, in the earlier levels of occupation, there's, they're usually exploited sort of whole animals. Um, if you think about it in terms of a meta going on your, your labor rotation, right? you bring all your animals with you. And why uh, open yourself up to some sort of debt, right? when you can just butcher an animal. However, throughout the colonial period, there's more of a shift to sort of individual cuts, right? So rather than by SB2 um, and a little bit SB3, we're mostly finding, rather than whole animals, sort of, you know, leg bones, things like that. So we're not, things like vertebrae, or at least on the camelid side, things like vertebrae, skulls, you know, all the things you would expect if you're butchering a whole animal, we don't really see that anymore, which, I interpret it sort of they're purchasing, you know, a leg from the market. Yes, Charlotte. I was wondering, could you talk a little bit about how this system either articulates or is different from what's happening with changes in silver mining as well? Because it strikes me that it has to be, or it strikes me that it would be correlative where you, mercury is so kind of noxious that people have to change their labor systems um, mm -hmm. and how that actually influences silver production. Is there a similar breakdown of time periods that you're witnessing? Yeah, so these, these are two, um, you know, they're really linked. Um, there's a vice lord early on, this is these are the two pillars that hold up the kingdom. Um, and they're linked in ways that the Spanish, I think, don't really appreciate. Um, one way to think about, this is a bit of an anachronism, but in some ways Mercury acts as the Federal Reserve, in which if you want to produce more coinage, in the economy, if you want to produce more silver, 
you produce more mercury. Um, the Spanish, beginning in the 1570s, uh, sort of, they began leasing out silver mining. So silver mining was privately done. You had to pay a tax, but it was privately done. Whereas mercury mining was sort of, again, another mechanism, but it was nationalized. Mer mercury mining was held by the state. The reason this is, is there's lots of silver mines. There's really, in this case, well, at least in the Indian example, there's only one mercury mine. And because they knew the exact ratio of mercury needed to produce silver, rather than running around and trying to tax individual silver owners and say, okay, how much did you make, how much tax, how much did you make, how much tax, you just control, the, the Spanish state just controlled the source of mercury. And so they know they doled out five quintales, or sort of measurement of mercury to a silver miner, they knew how much they should expect to be produced and therefore how much tax should be paid. So there is sort of a linkage between the two. There's a very strong linkage between the two. Yes, sir? Kind of related to that, were, were there any significant shifts in the value of mercury throughout these periods? And does that in any way kind of affect those? So the mercury value was always a set price. Um, there, is, there are some shifts. It gets slightly more expensive. But it, it's um, operating on sort of uh, Roughly every 20, 30 years, they would um, have a meeting and they'd set the price of mercury. So it was always at a fixed price. Um, it would be really interesting to sort of get a sense of what the black market's going, what's, what's happening there, um, but I, I don't really have a handle on those archives. Um, but yeah, silver fluctuates up and down, but mercury is always at a fixed price set by the state. Yes, Tiffany. Yeah, so many interesting threads going on here. I'm wondering if you can pull some of them together for me. Um, sure. So the one that I, I think I really latched on to is this thing that keeps circulating about um, who gets to be a capitalist. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in the formation or the formulation of that question. Mm -hmm. My immediate response is who wants to be a capitalist in this space, right? So, um, so maybe we could play with that a little bit. But also, you know, I had moments where um, you mentioned sort of the unequal distribution of um, burden of the, the capitalist system, right? So even what, you know, so the offhand you had about um, the bioarchaeological evidence of mm -hmm. women working in the mines when they're not supposed to be, right? right? And then women being those who actually sort of lead the front, if you will, if I understood mm -hmm. well, right? Yep. Um, on, on this sort of new form yes. of um, extraction. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I, I think trying to put piece those links together for myself, to get you know who gets to be a capitalist and on whom is, is capitalism uh, dependent, right? But also like who um, who is expendable for the actual formation of like capitalist expansion in, the, in this region. And the, the reason I think that's an interesting sort of circulation you have going on here is because your fourth quadrant looks like stronger social institutions and weaker um, coercive mm -hmm. practices, right? But is that is that weaker coercive practice um, predicated on the fact that like a certain group of people have been equally carrying that burden in order for that, that system to form, right? Mm -hmm. So these are just like, I, I thought they were a great set of questions and I just sort of wanted you to yeah, the, the, um, so I'll take the first one, the, the who gets to be a capitalist. Um, there's a long tradition, and this is in the Carl Polanyi and um, uh, like John Murrow who worked in the Andes. Um, there's sort of a long tradition of sort of kind of this anti-market mentality being brought forward in which sort of markets are seen as something that is at least in the colonial context, it's something that is done to people. And while that's certainly true, right, I mean, we can think of all kinds of case studies where markets were imposed or placed down in colonial context and caused a lot of social upheaval and uh, social dissolution. I do think there's also a lot of times where people use markets against colonial powers, where people use sort of exchange systems or they use it to subvert. Um, in this case, you know, the, um, in areas in other parts of Peru, the one I know best is Senator Costco, um, 
people were forced into sort of debt slavery, wage labor, debt slavery, during the 1900s um, fairly quickly. And in this case, they were able to resist it. And I think they were able to resist this commodification of labor through participating in commercial markets elsewhere, right? So they increasingly engage in commercial transactions on the commodity side, right? They're producing mercury, they're trading, and things like that, as a way of resisting another form of commodification. So it's sort of, when I think about who gets to be a capitalist, it's um, who gets to use markets and how do markets uh, offer opportunities sometimes to resist other forms of commodification. Does that make sense? Um, in terms of sort of the household and women, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, uh, you know, there are lots of reports that the men, um, so sort of for cosmological reasons, women were not supposed to go underground, um, but they did. But generally speaking, they weren't. And there's often reports of the men sleeping in the mine overnight. And so when I'm looking at kind of the household material culture, I think I'm really mostly looking at sort of women and children and sort of the extended family, much rather than the mining. Um, labor, which I think is another thing that uh, I often try to emphasize because when we think of miners, right, we think of like men with a pack of red, to, like, you know, grabbing the pick, right? And in this case, it's not, it's not the case, right? It's much more complex than that. Um, and I think it's much more sort of female oriented in a way that is exploitative, again, but also offers opportunities. Yes. Um, thanks so much. It's very interesting. And if we shift to thinking about capitalism in terms of the presence of capital mm -hmm. in the production process, mm -hmm. rather than capitalism in terms of sure. markets, can you talk a little bit, or do you have a sense of how much capital is involved in the vertical tunneling, mm -hmm. right? To, mm -hmm. I'm not sure tunneling is the right word, but the construction nope. of the vertical shafts, yeah. to me, seems like that's that's a place where I see the presence of capital yes. uh, as part of a factor of production, right? So Correct. where else here, because I don't want to collapse who gets to be a capitalist. There's a lot, I mean, a capitalist who has fixed assets and produces by the deployment right. of capital right. is very different from a quote unquote capitalist who right. sets out a few goods. This is just like, this, this, I'm, 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 I'm upset, right? So if, if we think about where is capital part of the production process in a significant way. Is there any place else other than the shafts that I missed? So I think maybe a better way to frame it would be who gets to be commercial rather than who gets to be capitalist. Right, okay, no, but I'm interested in, um, in, in, in the capitalist. In the, um, in the case of capital, so there's two things. First, um, capital in this case is not just sort of coinage or silver or kind of capital in the classic sense, but it's also mercury. A lot of the, um, looking at the notary documents, a lot of, you know, you want to buy a house, mm -hmm. You plop down mercury, right? I mean, that, that, that became, in terms of the um, sort of economy within the city, mercury was often used as a currency. In terms of capital and the mining activity, um, the two areas you see it are in the construction of the shafts. So, for example, the large audit, the entrance mm -hmm. that I showed several times, that cost um, 1 million pesos mm -hmm. in about 40 years to construct, mm -hmm. and it was a massive investment. Um, and then in the refining. Technologies. So one thing, you, yes, yes. And so one thing, and um, there's a better argument for this in Photo C, but um, often when we see shifts in different mining, I'm uh, sorry, different refining technologies, um, there's I think a tendency to think about it in terms of scientific advancement. It is in some ways, but also in some ways, it's about the ability to deploy capital to create more sort of efficient refining ways, right? So um, a lot of these, a lot of the, um, so the Habeca and the Buscanilla refining ovens um, were not new inventions, especially back, I mean, that's actually an Arabic root word. It was used in more Spain for hundreds of years. Um, it appears once you sort of have increasing merchants moving in from Lima or Ayacucho, right, with capital to construct it. So, it, it's reflective more of the intensification of capital in the refining process rather than sort of a advancement. 
Yes, Bob. Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't a different way of your case study is absolutely wonderful and detailed. Wouldn't there be a different way of looking at the whole thing on a broader scale that, you know, my colleague Mark Naomi says historical archaeology is archaeology capitalism. I don't agree with that. It's archaeology is a modern world in which capitalism is one aspect. Rise of nation states, national monarchies, all these other things. It's not a question of who are the capitalists and who aren't, who wants to be or is allowed to be. It's that everyone is drawn into the same system eventually. Whether there are Europeans in America or whether they're around the world, we all end up in a capitalistic, is one aspect of the modern world system, including academics. And uh, so that capitalism is part of the modern world as a cultural evolutionary stage on a global level rather than uh, totally differentiated as you move around the world. You know, over the last 500 years, everyone's brought into a more and more similar world system. Mm -hmm. That's to do with cultural evolution. It's not only the cultural evolution. I am not. Okay. <laughs> I make sense. <laughs> um, I, one way I guess to think about it, or one way I like to think about it, um, it's not whether sort of if we're going to look at this in a cultural evolutionary sense, whether it's um, right or wrong, um, and I mean correct or not, um, if you think sort of in the history of anthropology, 1960s, um, uh, service, Solins, right, we're arguing about bands, tribes, chiefs, and states, right? And that argument sort of fizzled out. I think we found as archaeologists much more productive things to start thinking about Okay, rather than argue about bands, tribes, chiefs, and states, what do these things do, right? So let's think about wealth and stable finance. Let's think about attached and independent production, uh, specialization, right? So let's think about different variables rather than just arguing, is this a tribe, is this a chiefdom, is this a state? And I kind of see my intervention here in a similar way, to rather than arguing, because um, frankly I'm just tired about arguing, like, is this capitalist or is this not, but rather, what do these things do, and how do they interact with other institutions? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense in ethnography and in archaeology, except if you push that to its logical conclusion, everything drops into specificity. Yes. So, it picks up. so that's why I'm going to call All right, is there anything else? I'm going to need some time. All right, thank you all.